when we come to chapter 5 now, we actually just continue right on in this scene in heaven. You see, the church now is in heaven, and I think it's well for us to spend a little time here to get acquainted where we're going. You wouldn't buy real estate in Florida, I'm sure, without seeing it. I had an uncle that bought property down there, and he went down and he said he had some of the finest alligators that you've ever seen because all of his property was underwater. He bought it sight unseen. And there are people buying property here in California that way. And believe me, we've got a lot of desert here, and you find out that you're sure going to get a whole lot of cactus when you buy a lot sight unseen. And right now, a great many people are buying property out in the Hawaiian Islands. And you'd be surprised how much of that is actually nothing in the world but a lava bed and not really very attractive even in the Hawaiian Islands. Now, if you're going to heaven, you want to know something about where we're going. And that is the reason this ought to be interesting to us. Now, we see here the church is in heaven with Christ. He said, where I am, that's where you're going to be, and we're going to be with him. Now, we have that here in chapter 5 as well as chapter 4. Now, we have here in the first four verses the book with seven seals. And then we have Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and the Lamb which has been slain. And it takes both of these to represent him, and that's verses 5 through 10. And then we see myriads of angels of heaven. They're created intelligences without number. And they join the song of praise and redemption, because they're going to sing a new song there, and that's about redemption. That's verses 11 and 12. Then you have the universal worship of the Savior and Sovereign of the universe, verses 13 and 14. Now, this chapter, as we've indicated, continues the same theme as the preceding one. The scene is set in heaven, preparatory to the events of the great tribulation. And since the church is in heaven with him, they sure couldn't go through the great tribulation down here on the earth. Now, the throne was the center of chapter 4. And the lion and the lamb, both of whom represent Christ, are the center of this chapter. For he is the lamb on the throne. He is both sovereign and savior. He is in full charge of all the events which follow in this book. And let's don't lose sight of him. That's very important. Now, let's look at this book with seven seals here in the first four verses. He says, "...and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals." Now, let me give you now my translation. "...and I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back, close sealed, that is, sealed tightly, with seven seals. Now, the way this chapter opens, and that is a connective, a little conjunction that says something went before, and that is the string that ties us into chapter 4, you see, that actually we don't need a chapter division here, I'm glad they made it. it. makes it a little helpful, but we don't really need it at all because it's all the same subject. And I saw here on the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Now, John is the witness of these events. You see, this is something that he sees now. Someone has written me a very interesting letter, which means that they are a very careful listener. They said, you are an artist because you draw word pictures. Well, I disagree with that. I'm no artist of any kind whatsoever. And they say that you say constantly, isn't that a wonderful picture? Or isn't that a picture for you? Well, I actually was totally unconscious that I used that expression, but I guess I do. May I say to you, I think that we ought to bring all our senses to bear here in the Word of God, and especially in Revelation. John is seeing and he's hearing. And one of the reasons that for years I used 
slides in my services, and I used them quite frequently. And I received some criticism for it. They said, you ought not to bring that into the church. Well, my friend, may I say to you, we need to see a, a lot of things today. We need to hear a lot of things. And the Word of God should grasp and lay hold of all of our senses of tasting and smelling even. My, I tell you, there are certain scenes in this book that you can smell them, and there are places where you can smell the fire and brimstone. And that's important. Now, we find here that God the Father holds in his hand a scroll, which is rolled tightly and sealed closely with seven seals. Now, it was the manner in that day, Stauffer is the one that calls our attention that the Roman law required a will to be sealed seven times as illustrated in the wills left by Augustus and Vespasian for the ones that were to succeed them. That was the method that was used. But we know in the book of Revelation that the number seven is not just an accidental number. It wasn't used just because they used it in the Roman Empire. But it's interesting that seven was used. Now, Godet considers this the book of the New Covenant. Others label it the book of judgment. Walter Scott considers it the revelation of God's purpose and counsel concerning the world. It perhaps should bear no title as it is, as Dr. Ironside has suggested, the title deed to this world. And you find out that was God's method. You remember when the children of Israel were going into captivity, Jeremiah was instructed to have his servant to go and buy some property and to get the title deed to it because these people were going to be returned to the land. Now, I think that what you have here is a title deed. And who holds the title deed to this earth down here? Well, none other but the Lord Jesus. He alone has it. There are several explanations regarding this. I think probably I ought to turn to several passages of Scripture right at this point. In the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, verse 13, I read, "...I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now, I believe that here you have a suggestion that what is being handed over to the Lord Jesus, and we'll see it will be handed over to him, is the title deeds to this world in which you and I live. He created it. He redeemed it. It belongs to him. And that is the picture that is given to us. And you also have the same thing, you remember, in Zechariah. And you remember I told you in Zechariah, that you need to know it to understand Revelation. In the fifth chapter, he says, "...then I turned and lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, a flying roll." Same thing. And he said unto me, "...what seest thou?" And I answered, "...I see a flying roll, the length thereof twenty cubits, the breadth thereof ten cubits." Then said he unto me, "...this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off." And some think that the Ten Commandments are on this and that the world is to be judged according to those commandments. There have been many suggestions, and I would like to make this suggestion because, very candidly, I feel like that it's more in line than any other that I have come across. And I believe that to be more specific, it represents God's new covenant with Israel. And he talks about that a great deal. Jeremiah had said that, behold, he'd make a new covenant. 
that he'd write the law not upon tables of stone, but upon their hearts. And now in Romans, the 11th chapter, we find Paul writing, beginning at verse 26 and 27. I'm reading now. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now, if you turn over to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, at verse 16, you'll read language like this. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Now, that is the thing that Jeremiah had mentioned in the 31st chapter. Now, I'll read on here in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there's no more offering of sins. You see, the old covenant God had made with Israel depended on man. The Ten Commandments said, do, do, do. And it depended upon the weak arm of the flesh, and as a result, it failed. Not because there was anything wrong with the Ten Commandments or with the law God gave. The problem was with man. It's just the same thing that you have in the Garden of Eden. So many people feel like there was something wrong with that fruit or that that tree was something unusual. Well, I think it was good fruit and just like any other. The problem was not the fruit on the tree. It was the pear on the ground where the problem was. Now, this new covenant depends on the power of the throne of God. It depends upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We have in verse 2 this, "...and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof." Now, who has a right and title to this world? Who can rule it? Who can establish justice and righteousness? You think maybe the Democrats can do it? You think the Republicans can do it? Do you think this country can do it? You think the United Nations can do it? I trust that you are not so deluded at this late time in the history of the world that you believe that man can solve his own problems. The Word of God makes it very clear that he can. When it says here, a strong angel... It means a powerful angel, and he has a loud voice. We're speaking now of power, that which is needed to make this new covenant effective. Now I read verse 3, "...and no man in heaven or on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon." In other words, there was no man of Adam's line that had a right to it. There have been a great many that have tried to do it. Adam lost dominion through sin. Moses was the lawgiver, but he was also a lawbreaker. David and his line failed. None of Adam's line qualifies. There's none today. The ruler must be a redeemer. The sovereign must be a savior of mankind. He's the only one. Now, John says here that this disturbed him, that Adam, well, stand aside, Adam, you can't do it. And none of your children, all Adam's children, can't do it. And Satan, he's working at it, but he can't do it. And who's going to be able to do it? Well, notice what happened. John says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. This disturbed John a great deal. This man had a real passion for prophecy, and he had a holy affection 
and a pious curiosity. He wanted to look into the things that even angels can't look into. And John enters into the drama because he's come from earth. And the revelation, you see, was written in tears. Is the earth to continue in sin and sorrow? Is there no future for the earth? Well, listen to Paul in Romans 8, 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Is no one competent to rule this earth? John is overwhelmed by the possibility that there may be no one. Paul again says, "...for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now." Romans 8, 22. Personally, I think evolution is the most pessimistic philosophy and theory that anyone can entertain today. No wonder it's led to so many suicides among the intelligentsia. What hope is there? if it took millions of years to get where we are today. Well, what is the hope for the future? Isn't there someone that can straighten out this problem? And it's so petty and so little and narrow-minded to hear politicians say, we're going to make peace in our time. We're going to do that. And it is even more tragic to hear the church say today, that they can straighten out the affairs of the world or that they can even evangelize the world. Oh, my brother, there's just not any around here that can qualify to open this book and take charge of this earth that we're on. And John weeps a great deal because of that. And it's a good thing that this book was not opened here or shown here in Southern California because we've got just a whole parcel of preachers that could tell you what's in the book on the inside, on the outside, and all around it. They can even tell you what's on the cover. They have all the answers today. Well, poor John, (laughs) it's too bad that he, instead of being in Patmos, he could just been in California because we've got them that can give you the answers today. Well, John didn't have the answer. We're going to have to find one that can open that book. Now we are told, and we come now to Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and the Lamb which has been slain. And I read here, and one from among the elders, I'm reading my translation, saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath overcome to open the book and the seven seals thereof. And I'd like to say to John also, don't weep, John, if you don't find anyone in heaven that can open the book and got all the answers, just come on here to Southern California. We got them. They'll give you the answer to all of these. Now, will you notice, evidently, any one of the elders could have answered. They had a spiritual illumination. And this, I think, Father identifies them as the church. The Lord Jesus had said to his own in John fifteen fifteen, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Now the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who has the right and title to this earth. He not only redeemed you and me, but he redeemed the earth. He is identified in this section in all his ministries that relate to the earth. Now, he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Root of David. The Lion of the tribe of Judah identifies him, of course, with the tribe of Judah. That was the thing that you recall that old Jacob, when he was dying, called his twelve sons around him. Why, we find that at that time he gave a prophecy concerning Judah. And that's in Genesis 49, 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? 
The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The Lord Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now he's the root of David. In Second Samuel, the seventh chapter, that great chapter there of God's covenant with David, I'm going to break one in your line that will rule not only over these people, but over the whole earth. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, he has the right to rule as he is the fulfillment of the prophecies made in the Old Testament relative to the future of the world. All of those prophecies will be fulfilled at his second coming to the earth to establish his kingdom. Now I read, And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. We're a little confused here. We saw a lion, and now he's a lamb. Stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, John's still a spectator to this scene. He said, I beheld, I saw this. Now, a lamb, here the word for lamb is in the diminutive. Literally, it means a little lamb. It denotes its gentleness and its willingness to be sacrificed. He's led as a lamb to the slaughter. And he didn't open his mouth at all. That was the picture of him. He was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And as it had been slain... That indicates the redemptive and vicarious substitutionary death of Christ. And the emphasis is upon the fact that he was slain with violence here. And he stood. Rather, he's standing. Well, that speaks of resurrection. He's no longer seated at the right hand of God. He's moving now, and he's moving to power, and he's coming to this earth. The judgment of the tribulation is getting ready to strike the earth. The winds are already blowing on the earth. Now he's in the midst of the throne. That is indicative of the fact that he's before the throne and ready to act as the righteous judge. And seven horns denotes perfect power. Now a horn speaks of power. Turn to Daniel 7, 8, if you want to have a confirmation of that. He is omnipotent. And seven eyes denotes he has perfect knowledge. He's omniscient. He is the omnipotent and the omniscient God. And he moves in the fullness of the Spirit, who is the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Now, here he is, a lion and a lamb. The lion character refers to his second coming. The lamb character refers to his first coming. The lion speaks of his majesty. The lamb speaks of his meekness. As a lion, he is a sovereign. As a lamb, he's a savior. As a lion, he is a judge. As a lamb, he is judged. The lion speaks of the government of God, and the lamb speaks of the grace of God. Now, verse 7, "...he came and took out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, and took as correctly he hath taken." He moves to the throne through the tribulation. He judges the world in righteousness before he reigns in righteousness. He's no longer the intercessor of the church, for the church is now with him. He's beginning to act as judge, and the movement here is important. Verse 8, "...and when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders..." fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Now, when he took the book, and that is Aries tense, this is the great movement of all creation. And he takes over now. Notice the worship of the Lamb by the four living creatures and the 24 elders. And the harp denotes praise. Now, the elders do not play on the harps, if you notice. That's just a token of praise to God. I'm so glad to find out I'm not going to be an angel and I'm not going to play on a harp. That just doesn't appeal to me. You may want a harp, and I guess if you want one, they'll get you one in heaven, but I'm thankful I don't have to have one. Now, the four and twenty elders act as priests 
Only the church is a priesthood of believers in heaven. Dr. Carl Armadine gives this arresting thought. The prayer of Christ for believers is answered in the elders, that they might know him. Here they are, right in his presence, that they might be with him. They are with him there, that they might behold his glory. Now, the vials full of odors is more accurately bowls full of incense, and that's the prayers of the saints. You see, this just happens to be the church there. They are the priesthood. Now, in verses 9 and 10, "...and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth." And probably I should read my translation all the way through. Let me read it. They sing a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book, to open the seals of it. For thou wast slain, didst purchase unto God in thy blood men of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and madest them unto our God a kingdom and priests. They shall reign on the earth. Now, they indicates that both living creatures and elders sing this song. The angelic hosts join the church here in praise, and they sing. That denotes the continuation of praise. Praise is directed to the Lamb with the book. He's praised now as the Redeemer of man in all ages and races. And this is going to be the first time that I'm going to sing. I've never been able to sing, but I'm going to be in that chorus, friends. I'm going to sing praises unto Him. Now, the new song is the song of redemption. The old song is the song of creation. You remember way back in the book of Job that the sons of God, you know, they sang. And they were singing because God was a creator. They didn't know anything really about the love of God then. And now we can sing about it, you know. We have a Savior that loves us, gave himself for us. What a picture we have here. Now, worthy reveals that he now fills the entire horizon of praise and worship. And that's what worship is. It's returning to worth what belongs to him. And he's the only one worthy of praise. They sing of his shed blood in heaven. Down here, many denominational churches are taking the blood from their hymn books. But may I say, in heaven, they're going to put it back in the hymn book. They're going to sing about the blood up there. And I guess maybe that's the reason the Lord's not going to embarrass some of them by taking them into heaven, because they'd have to sing about the blood. Now, the change of pronoun from us to them is important. They are praising the Lamb for those yet to be saved on the earth, the tribulation saints. And a kingdom and priests refer to the tribulation saints. The church will not reign on the earth, but over the earth. And that's important. Now, there are myriads of angels of heaven that join in this song. I'm reading my translation, "...and I saw and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousands of ten thousands, myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a great voice, Worthy is the Lamb that has been slain to take the power and riches, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. It all belongs to him. John says, I saw and I heard many angels around the throne, and the number of them's fantastic. I think that they're probably innumerable, and that's what he means here. John says, I looked and I saw a company around the elders, and I thought that was great, and they were singing. And then he says, all of a sudden, I looked out yonder, and boy, there was a crowd. I couldn't count them. Nobody could count them. A computer couldn't count them. His created intelligence is praising him. You see, I don't know why you want to go to heaven if you don't want to praise him and worship him down here. Now we have the universal worship 
of the Savior and Sovereign of the universe. And it closes on this note, verses 13 and 14. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Every animate creature of God joins in this universal act of worship, both in heaven and earth. Evidently, the animals in the earth, the fish in the sea, join in this volume of praise. And the living creatures add their amen to it. And the church here falls down in silent adoration and praise. Oh, my friend, I think the proper way to conclude this today would be for me to sing the Hallelujah Chorus. But I can't sing, and I don't have the Hallelujah Chorus before me. And you're very fortunate that I don't. But I do believe that as we come to the end of this very remarkable scene in heaven, that we see that all praise and honor and worship must go to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not in the habit of praising Him and worshiping Him, why don't you start right now? Because next time we're going to move into that period known as the Great Tribulation period when we see the opening of the seven-sealed book. And I want to tell you it's a tremendous picture that's given to us there. Now, friends, we come today to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. And actually, this is the great watershed, the great divide of the book of Revelation. Here is a division that, let me say, is all important. I know traveling on old Highway 66 across northern New Mexico, you go through Albuquerque and Gallup, New Mexico, and Winslow, and then up to Flagstaff. Now, between Flagstaff and Winslow, there's a place called the Great Divide, or the Continental Divide is the way I think they label it. I found the same thing over in Colorado, up at Berthoud Pass. And I'm told that in both of these places, you could drop a chip in a stream that is flowing toward the west on the west side of the divide, and it would end up in the Pacific Ocean. Or you could put a chip on the east side of the divide, and it would end up eventually in the Atlantic Ocean by way of the Gulf of Mexico, of course. But this is a very important division, by the way, very important. It actually separates those two chips and their worlds apart. That's what we have here in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. And the reason for that is that we've come to the third major division. Now, we said that in chapter 4, and actually there is where it is. But what happened in chapter 4? We found ourselves transferred to heaven. John was caught up, and we went right up with him because we began to see things in heaven. And we didn't see anything labeled the church because the church was the name given to it down here. But we saw the 24 elders, and we went up with John, and the elders had to get up there some way. They were caught up, and they represent the church. And the church we find now in heaven. And it's no longer mentioned from here on in the book of Revelation on the earth at all. Oh, there's an invitation at the end that comes from the church, but that refers back to this day in which we live. But you have here an orderly process in the book of Revelation. And we need to follow Peter's rule for prophecy, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. That is, you don't interpret it by itself. It must be looked at as a system and a program, and it must fit in with the others. Now, by the time you get to the sixth chapter, a great many forget that John gave to us an orderly division of the book of Revelation. 
He said back in Revelation 1, 19, "...write the things..." This is what he was told to do, "...the things which thou hast seen." And that was that glorious vision of the glorified Christ as the great high priest amidst the lampstands where he's keeping the light burning here on the earth. And that's his picture. And then we were given the things that are. And we had seven churches which represent the total earthly experience of the church from the day of Pentecost to the parousia, from the upper room to the upper air, that this is the total history of the church on earth. Then he was told, "...and the things which shall be hereafter." Metatauta. So we ended the earthly career of the church at the end of chapter 3. And then we were told, "...metatauta, after these things." And believe me, he mentioned it twice there. He couldn't get away from it. He did that for the benefit of those who hold a historic viewpoint of Revelation, the amillennialists today. He says, after this, metatata, and he would show the things which must be hereafter. And that's metatata. That's chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation. So, beginning there, it was new. But the two chapters we had, 4 and 5, we were in heaven. We were there with John. And the first thing we saw was a throne. And the Lord Jesus is there. And he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, who's sitting at God's right hand, waiting till his enemies have made his footstool down here. Then in chapter 5, he's the lamb. And we see the emphasis upon his first coming, that he's the lamb. But the lamb is the one, because he's the redeemer, that was able to take the book, which is the title deeds of this earth, And did you know that he's the only one that's able to judge this earth? And he's the only one that's able to judge it, not only because of who he is, he's God manifest in the flesh, but by what he's done. He created this earth, and that gives him a right. And he's worshipped in chapter 4 as the Creator. Then he also redeemed this earth. And we see that in chapter 5. He's worshipped as the Redeemer. Since he's the Creator and Redeemer, he's the only one worthy to judge this earth. He's the only one that's able to rule this earth. What a reflection upon the consummate conceit of little men down here who want to be judges. What right has the Supreme Court to judge anyone. What right has the Senate or the House of Representatives or the President to judge anyone? Who do they think they are today? May I say to you, who is worthy to sit in judgment? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is worthy. And until one of these boys can measure up to him, they are not really in a position to judge in their own ability and strength. And any human judge down here that does not look to God is not worthy to sit on any bench and judge anyone. And that would even be a police court today. And may I say to you that the injustice that's on this earth is brought about because a little man sitting in judgment on others. Jesus Christ is worthy. And that's the picture that is given to us as we close that chapter. Now, when we come to chapter 6, the scene shifts down here to the earth. And the question, naturally, what happened on the earth when the church left? Well, the great tribulation took place. And we have here first the great tribulation in the world from chapter 6 through 18. Then we have the opening of the seven-sealed book here in chapter 6 through chapter 7, and actually through chapter 8, verse 1. And these seven seals here open up the great tribulation period. The Lord Jesus breaks the seals. The first four horses ride forth. And then you have the martyr dead during that period. And then you have 
the day of wrath coming and the seals in a very orderly way, the seventh seal introduces the blowing of seven trumpets. The blowing of the seventh trumpet introduces seven startling persons. And when we come to that beast out of the sea, that introduces the seven bowls of wrath in chapters 15 and 16. And then the last bowl of wrath brings to us the burden or the judgment of Babylon. Chapters 17 and 18, that brings to an end the great tribulation period, and then Christ comes to the earth. It's quite interesting to note that Babylon is the first judgment, and it's the last judgment. Babylon at the Tower of Babel represents the first organized rebellion against God. That's in Genesis 11. And then Babylon represents the last rebellion against God, both religiously, that's Revelation 17, and politically, that's chapter 18. And we find here that this brings to an end man's little day on this earth. Now, the important thing for us to keep before us is the one who was worthy to open that book. He's directing everything now. And that means that we have in this book, as we were told at the beginning, it's the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. He's no longer walking among the lampstands, for they all have been removed from this earth. He's no longer the high priest standing as intercessor, but he's now the executor of God's will upon the earth as he opens the seals of the book. All of the judgments of the great tribulation usher forth from the seals out of which come the trumpets, the persons, and the bowls. And the great tribulation is triggered from heaven. Jesus Christ directs the entire operation. And that's the reason we've said in Psalm 2, he shall break them with a rod of iron. Somebody said they don't like all this. You don't? Well, do you have a better suggestion? If you do, would you pass it on to the Lord Jesus of how he's going to put down the rebellion on this earth? How do you think he'd put it down? Suppose he came like he did 1,900 years ago. Do you think that in Moscow today they are ready in the Kremlin to turn it over to him? How about our country today? I'm telling you, they're not even about to turn it over to him in Washington, and neither party is interested in putting Jesus Christ on the throne. They've got some very unworthy men on both sides that would like to be on the throne. Oh, my friend, may I say to you that he alone is the one that is worthy. And how is he going to come to power? Just exactly like the second Psalm said, he'll break them with a rod of iron, and we're going to have that from now on. This is judgment on the earth. Now, the church was delivered. Why? Because they were such nice, sweet Sunday school children? Oh, no. They were sinners, but they were saved by the grace of God. And only those that have rejected the grace of God go in the great tribulation period. That's my reason for believing that God's raised up radio today. And I think it's a better means than television to get the Word of God out to the ends of the earth. And he's going to let them all hear the gospel. And then when they make their decision, that'll decide whether they're going into the great tribulation or not. Now, chapter 4, we saw the throne and the triune God. Chapter 5, we saw the book the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are certain factors that are brought into focus which increase the intensity and the ferocity of the Great Tribulation. Let me mention five of them here. The Holy Spirit restrains evil no longer. Somebody says, you mean he left the world? No, he didn't. He was in the world before the day of Pentecost, the calling out the church. But on the day of Pentecost, he assumed a new ministry of baptizing believers into the body of Christ and of filling them and of indwelling them. 
and uh, leading and guiding them in this world. And he'll take the church out. It doesn't mean that he's going to leave. He'll still be here, but he won't restrain evil any longer. In other words, man's going to have his little day during this period. And so is Satan. That's the reason I don't want to be here. Then the second thing, the true church as light and salt is removed. The church has very little influence in the world, but it still has a little. And when it leaves the earth, there'll be none left. Then the third is the devil knows he has but a short time. And he's going to make hay while the sun shines. He's going to take advantage of it during this period. And God's going to give him free reign. We'll see that in this period. And the fourth thing, evil men are free to carry out their nefarious plans. In other words, Antichrist. He'll be able to take over this earth for a brief period of time. And then the fifth, there is direct judgment from God. And we have that, by the way, in this chapter here in verse 17, if you'll notice there. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? This is a tremendous period, you see. And the great tribulation, I do not think, breaks suddenly like a great tornado. The opening of the seals is gradual, logical, chronological. They're open one at a time. The book of Revelation makes sense. And as we come to this chapter now to the text, may I make this statement very carefully. And that is, from here on, that is actually from chapter 4 on, it is future. It's future. Now, if it is future... And we're in the time when the things that are, the period of the church, and these things reach into the future, then may I say to you, don't try to drag any of the seals or any of the trumpets or any of the bowls or any of these persons up into this period because they don't belong in this period. And they'll not appear in this period. Now, I think we're seeing the setting of a stage today, but I don't think that any of these things are taking place today. Yet we find that a great many men are doing just that. And it's sensationalism, of course, and it, I guess, gets listeners and it sells books. But it sure isn't according to the way John put it down here. It's quite logical now. And we want to put that down as an axiom that from here on it's future. And it's going to come to pass, but none of these things has come to pass. When we went through the church, seven churches, we could fit that into history. You can't fit any of this into history. Now, that's the difference between the futurist and the historic viewpoint. Although it's quite interesting to me that many who hold the historical viewpoint, the historical school, many of them assume that this is future from here on. Our a little farther down, they make it future. In other words, they just can't fit it into history. The Amalernalist attempts to fit everything from here on into history. And as a result, there are about 50 different systems of interpretation, according to Dr. Walvert, that have come out of the historical viewpoint. And friends, 49 of those are bound to be wrong. And personally, I think the other one is too. And also, let me quote again from Dr. Walvoord. He quotes from John Cummings' book, Lectures on the Apocalypse, and he holds the historic viewpoint. But he believes in the premillennial return of Christ and the futuristic character of the latter portion of the book of Revelation. That's quite interesting. But he made this startling statement. Now, I didn't make this statement. I'm not prepared to make it, but he made it. Listen, I'm reading now. I believe that one half of the professors of the gospel are nothing better than practical infidels. What do you think about that? That means that 50% of the church members today are not believers at all. That, my friend, I just say it and leave it right there. Because I went to a seminary that was all millennial and they attempted to fit in this rest of Revelation 
into the historical or the amillennial viewpoint. And it was almost, well, it was ridiculous at times to put that on. When we reached the place where it says Satan was put in a bottomless pit, and they believed that had already taken place. And I said, well, how do you explain the activity that is taking place today? Well, the professor explained it like this. He said, you know that he is chained, but he has a long chain on him. It says it's like when you take a cow out in a vacant lot and tether her out there on a long rope and let her graze. And that was his explanation. And my comment was, I said, Doctor, I think Satan's got a pretty long chain on him then because he's able to graze all over the world today. And it really makes some scriptures rather ridiculous when you follow that viewpoint. And I say very definitely John has made it clear here that we have now come to future things. And anything from here on in Revelation through the 19th chapter and 20th chapter, for that matter, is still future. And we're following a chronological order here. And it's very logical. And here you just don't pull up these things and say that they're taking place today or have taken place. You just can't fit them into history unless you water it down till it becomes practically meaningless. And I think that's very important. Now, the Lord Jesus is the one who took the book with the seals on it, and he alone could open that. He alone was worthy. And we open the first seal... And I'm going to read now from my translation. You follow the authorized version. That's still the best. None of these modern versions have made any improvement at all, including mine. It hasn't helped it at all. But all I've done, without trying to translate, but just pulling out of the original what John is saying. Will you listen? And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals... And I heard one of the four living creatures saying as a sound of thunder. Now, it's not come and see. It's go. It's a command from heaven. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and one sitting on him having a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ takes the seven-seal book. He breaks the first seal. And he's going to break them all, ad seriatim, right in order. The book of Revelation makes sense, friends. And he's in full charge, and every creature in heaven is moving at his command. And so the fourth horsemen now are going to ride forth. And he breaks the seal, and he says, go. And it's restated by John that he saw and he heard. This is television we're looking at. And to determine the symbolism of the rider on the white horse, that's given rise to a difference of opinion, many differences. The preponderance interpretation among commentators is that he represents Christ, and they use Psalm 45 and Revelation 19 in support of this position. But most of the contemporary Bible expositors of the premillennial school say that the white horse and the writer is Antichrist. And that's the position of Scott, Ironside, Schaefer, Walbert, Woodbridge, and Pentecost. And it happens to be my position also. Now, he rides forth, and Antichrist does not appear as a villain. After all, Satan's angels, they're angels of light. They don't look like demons. They don't have horns. And so Antichrist is going to come as the most attractive man that the world has ever seen so far because they didn't see the Lord Jesus and they don't see him today. But they're going to accept this man because he's come in his own name. And we are moving today in the direction of a world dictator. More and more is that true. All the nations of the world today are disturbed. Lawlessness abounds. Governments are not able to control as they should. This is all preparing the way for the coming 
of one who is going to rule. And he's not going to have horns or cloven feet. He's going to be the most attractive man the world has ever seen. And they will elect him, and the world will acclaim him. And when he takes over, it's sure going to be bad for the world. Now, this is not just the ravings of a preacher here in California. This is something that other men in other walks of life who apparently make no great claim to being a Christian have said. Professor A.J. Toynbee, who was director of studies in the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and I'm quoting him now, "...by forcing on mankind more and more lethal weapons, and at the same time making the whole world more and more interdependent economically, technology has brought mankind to such a degree of distress that we are ripe for deifying any new Caesar who might succeed in giving the world unity and peace." That's the end of the quotation. That will be the platform that Antichrist is coming in on. Unity of the world. One world and peace. And believe me, I think if anybody appeared on the scene now and had offered the world that, they wouldn't ask whether he came from heaven or hell. I don't think they'd care because there is today an obsession. We want peace and we've spent billions of dollars for it. G.K. Chesterton observed in his day, he says, "...one of the paradoxes of this age is that it's the age of pacifism, but not the age of peace." A great deal of talking about it. In a news item some time ago, a woman in Fayetteville, Arkansas, named the United Nations as the beneficiary of a $700,000 estate. And in her will, this was her statement, "...in the fervent hope that this relatively small contribution may be of some effect in bringing about universal peace on earth and goodwill among men." And I want to say she poured that money down a rat hole, because you're not going to buy peace with $700,000 or millions of dollars. We have given away billions of dollars throughout the world, and we don't have peace. And the Ford Foundation today is the world's wealthiest private organization, having listed resources of 492678255 dollars And it has announced that the money eventually will be used to work for world peace and better government, living and education conditions. And the world gets worse all the time. You see, when Antichrist comes to power, he's going to talk peace. And the world will think that it's entering the millennium when it's actually entering the Great Tribulation. You see, the Great Tribulation comes in like a lamb, but it goes out like a lion. That's the big lie that the world is going to believe. Now, this writer could not be Christ. Therefore, in view of the fact that Christ is the Lamb in the midst of the throne, who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, and he's directing these earthly events from heaven and is giving the orders to the four horsemen to ride. Christ is clearly identified in Revelation 19, while here... The identity is certainly obscure, which I think suggests that it's not Christ, but an imitation of him. Now we come to the second seal, and I read my translation. Follow the authorized version very carefully. That's still the best one. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Go, and another horse fiery red, flame-colored, went out. And although it doesn't say that he saw, he certainly did, because he wouldn't know it was flame-colored than red. And there was given to the one sitting on him to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill violently one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Now, the first horse couldn't be Christ, could it? 
because when he brings peace to this earth, it's going to be permanent. This was short-lived. Immediately after the first horse rode, the white horse, then here comes the red horse of war on the earth. You see the peace which the rider on the white horse brought to the earth? It was temporary and it was counterfeit. The Antichrist presents himself as a ruler who brings peace to the world, but he cannot guarantee it, for God says, There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And believe me, that passage of Scripture has certainly been fulfilled. And isn't that exactly what every one of the candidates for office in our country today, and certainly in my lifetime, I never shall forget that we were promised. I remember the candidate said that our boys would never go across the ocean and fight again and promised peace. We were going to have peace. And every candidate since then promised peace. What baloney that was. And one of them dropped two atom bombs. And I personally think that is a horrible thing to do to drop it on a hopeless, helpless, defenseless city. Why didn't they drop it where the war was going on? And it would have had its effect there. And yet that candidate, as far as I know, has never been criticized for that because immediately afterward we began to talk about peace. And every candidate since then, no exception, and regardless of party, they're all going to bring peace. And my friend, we are as far from peace today as we've ever been. And World War III, already the clouds are gathering for it. So that Antichrist was a phony. He didn't bring peace because here goes the fiery red horse of war riding throughout the earth again. And this is going to be a real world war. Now, don't say that this has been fulfilled. It hasn't been. This is future we're talking about. Now, notice the third seal. And I'm reading again my translation, Follow the Authorized Friends. That's the best translation, and I sure wouldn't recommend mine. Listen to this. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Go! And I saw. He says here he saw. Just want to make sure we knew that. This is television. And I saw, and behold, a black horse. And the one sitting on him, having a balance, that is, scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A conix, that is, a quart of wheat, for a denarius, and three conix, that is, three quarts of barley, for a denarius, and do not hurt the oil and the wine. Now, the color of the black horse speaks of mourning. And you'll find that's used in the Old Testament. I don't want to take time to look it up, but if you turn to Jeremiah 4.28, Malachi 3.14, you'd read there mournfully in black. And then it also speaks of famine. And you find that in a little book of the Bible that Jeremiah wrote. We call it Lamentations. And in the fourth chapter of Lamentations, and I'll turn there, I read in verse 8, "...their visage is blacker than a coal, they're known in the streets, their skin cleaveth to their bones, it's withered, it is become like a stick. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger, for these pine away, stricken through for want of the fruits of the field." It speaks of famine. The black horse speaks of the famine that's coming on the earth, a worldwide famine. And that is the picture of it. And always in war, after war and during a war, there's a shortage of foodstuffs. Now, let us look at this for just a moment. The Greek historian Herodotus says that the conix, the quart of corn, was a soldier's daily supply of food. And a denarius was a day's wage, so that a working man would be unable to support his family in that day. He'd have enough for himself as a soldier, but he couldn't support his family. Now, the oil and the wine are luxuries that are enjoyed by the rich. They get all the liquor they want, 
even in the time of war. Oil would correspond to our toiletries, to the beauty aids and the body conditioners and all that is used today. That is the luxuries of life. Now, the wine corresponds to the liquor that will be in abundance. Now, isn't it interesting? There's not enough food stuff, not enough barley, but there's enough barley to make liquor. And they will make it in that day, and the rich are the ones that get it. Now, let's be very frank today. During World War II, the rich, for the most part, they were able to get meat. They were able to get the luxuries of life. I happen to know of some that have told me, a very wealthy man told me that he never missed getting a big T-bone steak any time that he wanted it. Well, I can remember, friends, I got so tired of eating tongue, that is the only thing you remember that you didn't have to have a blue chip stamp to get. It was not something that was rationed. And I got so tired of eating tongue during that period. And I think of the fact that in this day that's coming, the thing won't change. The rich are going to get theirs, friends. But the poor won't be able to get theirs. And that's the way that it's been. I feel like saying ho-hum when I hear all of these sincere, egg-headed boys talking about how they're going to work out the poverty problem. And all that it has done, it's given a good job to a lot of these boys. But so far, it hasn't filtered down and has not really been a blessing to the poor yet and has never helped them to lift themselves up with any degree of pride. Why? Because, my friend, the only one that can lift you up is Jesus Christ. And none of these egg-headed boys are able to do it. Now, I'm sorry to have to say that, but somebody needs to speak out today against all of this tomfoolery that our government is going through and the waste and spending of money today. All that it does is just create another bureaucracy, and it saps up our tax dollar today. My, this sort of thing is abroad today. But just think what it's going to be in that day. This we're talking about is future. The only reason I make application today is to show that this is not unreasonable. It's going to take place. Now, it was way back in 1798 that the Reverend Thomas Malthus concluded that the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power of the earth to produce subsistence for man. And he made a prediction that there would come a time there'd be worldwide famine. And again, if I might quote Toynbee, sooner or later, food production will reach its limit. And then if population is still increasing, famine will do the execution that was done in the past by famine, pestilence, and war combined. And Sir John David Orr, who was the director general of the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, when he was in that office, he warned. He says, I shall finish my office by giving a last warning to the world. If it's not solved, there will be world chaos in the next 50 years. The nations of the world are insane. That's his statement, not mine. And someone has made the statement, there are today 750 million people getting hungrier in countries bordering the communist sphere. And this thing is growing. Famine always follows war. Then we come to the fourth seal, and the fourth horse rides forth. And again, I read my translation, "...when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures saying, Go." And I looked, and behold, a pale, greenish-yellow horse, and one sitting upon him. Death was his name, and Hades followed with him. And there was given unto them authority over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, and with famine, and with death, pestilence by the wild beasts of the earth. Here is a pestilence that's going to take out one-fourth of the population of the earth. There won't be enough antibiotics and penicillin to go around in that day to stop it. Now, death is personalized here. And next time I want to talk about that because 
Death is just more than cessation of physical activity. It's much more than that for a human being. Now we've had the riding of the four horsemen. And I want to say this, for this follows exactly the pattern that the Lord Jesus gave. He says in Matthew 24, verse 5, this is the Olivet Discourse, he says, First, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, the rider on the white horse. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, the red horse. And he says, See that you be not troubled. Then he goes on to say, For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, all right, the third horse, the black horse, and pestilences, the fourth horse, and earthquakes in divers places. These are just the beginning of sorrows. This is the opening of the great tribulation, you see. Now, our Lord said the identical thing in the Olivet Discourse. Now, when these horsemen ride, apparently a fourth of the population of the earth is removed by these judgments that come upon the earth. Now, death here is personalized. You'll notice death was his name. And that is the same thing that we have from Paul in Romans 5, 14, where he says, "...and nevertheless death became king from Adam down to Moses, and over them who did not sin after the fashion of Adam's sin or transgression." who is the type of him, that is, of Adam, who was to come, that is, the coming one. Now, death was his name. And then we are told that Hades followed with him. Now, the word for Hades is sometimes translated by the word hell, unfortunately. Over in Luke, the 16th chapter, verse 23 It says, speaking of the rich man and Lazarus, "...and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off Lazarus in his bosom." That's very unfortunate. It is this same word, Hades. And actually, it does not refer to hell at all. It speaks either of physical death, where the spirit goes, or it can speak of the grave where the body is placed. In other words, while death takes the body, Hades is the place where the spirit of a lost man goes. And the Lord Jesus gave it that way, you see. Now, Paul personifies death in this verse I've given from Romans 5.14. And as he does sin in that same section. And he does it for emphasis. You see, sin and death entered the world at the same time. Death is a result of sin. And during the interval from Adam to Moses, men did not commit the same sin as did Adam. Adam was put on a different basis. Nor was their sinning a transgression of a law as from Adam also, The Ten Commandments had not been given then. So you have a period there when men sinned and died. Nevertheless, Adam's sin became their sin, for they died as Adam died. Even babies died in the flood. Now, death has evidently an all-inclusive meaning that we do not attach to it ordinarily. We think of death referring only to the body, or what we call physical death. And it refers only to the body. And it comes to a man because of Adam's sin. Then there's what is known as spiritual death. That is separation from and rebellion against God. We inherit a dead nature from Adam. That is, we have no capacity for God, no desire for him at all. And then there is eternal death, and that's eternal separation from God. And unless a man is redeemed, 
This inevitably follows. And this is the second death that we will find later on in Revelation 20, 14. And I'm going to bring these three up again and develop them when we get to Revelation 20, 14. But you see, when Adam sinned, God said, in the day you eat, you will die. Well, he lived 900 and some odd years after that physically, but he was dead spiritually to God. He ran from God, no longer desire for fellowship with God. He died spiritually, and physical death followed and has come into the human family, and more and more it deteriorates mankind. Most of us are being propped up today anyway. That's the way we stay alive because of modern medicine and the marvelous developments of science. Actually, the human race is deteriorating all the time. Human life would be much shorter than it is if it were not for all of the modern gadgets to prop us up and keep us alive down here. Now, Adam is definitely declared here to be a type of Christ. Death must be laid at Adam's door as his total responsibility. You see, God did not create man to die. It was a penalty imposed because Adam transgressed God's command. His transgression is our transgression, and his death is our death. Thus, Christ is the head of a new creation, and this new creation has life in him, and only in Christ. He alone can give life. And he is totally responsible for the life and the bliss of those that are his own. Dr. Schaefer will put it like this, and this is a theological statement. Thus, spiritual death comes immediately through an unbroken line of posterity. Over against this, physical death is received from Adam immediately as each person dies in body because of his own personal share in Adam's first sin. Now, during the great tribulation, death will ride unbridled. The Lord Jesus put it like this, "...except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened." Now, at the great white throne, death is finally destroyed. And we are going to see that later on. Paul confirmed this. He said, "...the last enemy..." That shall be destroyed is death. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 26. And John reasserts it in Revelation 21, 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This is something that's very important for us to see. Now we see that the sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beast will decimate this earth by one-fourth. And this is something that God had said would come. Ezekiel had predicted it in Ezekiel 14, 21. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noisome beast and the pestilence, to cut off from it man and beast. So the pale horse represents plague and pestilence that will stalk the earth, and it will also encompass the possibility of germ warfare. And I don't want to get into that today, but there are men that have made this statement, and there's scientists. One of them, Dr. Holtman at the University of Tennessee, says, "...while the greater part of a city's population could be destroyed by an atomic bomb, the bacteria method might easily wipe out the entire population within a week. Now, that brings us down to the fifth seal. And I want to read again my translation in verses 9 and 10. Now, the four horsemen have ridden, and here we have the prayer of the martyred remnant. Uh, apparently, those that were slain in the Great Tribulation seem to be primarily the ones that are here. I have always felt that it included all the Old Testament saints. But let me read now my translation here. And when he opened the fifth seal, 
I saw under the altar of burnt sacrifice the souls of those slain on account of the Word of God and on account of the witness which they had. And they cried with a great voice, saying, How long, O Master, the holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now, this altar is in heaven and is evidently where Christ offered his blood for the sins of the world. And those of you acquainted with my book on the tabernacle know that I take that position that his literal blood is in heaven. Now, let me confirm that with Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And so we have here the Old Testament saints, as the Lord Jesus put it, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias. And now included with this are those in the great tribulation period, because we've already found a fourth of the population have been wiped out. And they are resting on Old Testament ground, and they're on good solid ground. They are only pleading for justice on the basis of God's holy law. Now, notice verse 11. And again, I'm reading my translation. "...that was given to them, that is, to each one a white robe. And it was said to them that they should rest in peace, yet for a little time until their fellow servants also and their brethren, who should be killed even as they were, should be fulfilled." In other words, the tribulation saints... All of them are to be included in the second resurrection, by the way. Now, that brings us to the opening of the sixth seal, and now the great day of God's wrath has come. This is evidently the beginning of the last half of the great tribulation period. We're going to make a division in it a little later on. But let me read again my translation, verses 12 and 13. And I saw when he opened... The sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the whole moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree casteth her up unripe figs when she is shaken of a great wind. Now, the great day of his wrath is before us, and it opens with these tremendous events in the heavens. In other words, at the beginning of the tribulation, you have all of these events taking place, and you also have it at the end of the great tribulation period. And you find that in Joel, the second chapter, verse 30, at the beginning of the tribulation, at the end, Joel 3, 9, 17. We've seen that before. Now, the fact we're having an increase of earthquakes today is no fulfillment of this at all. This is to take place in the Great Tribulation period. But the interesting thing is that earthquakes in the past have really taken off a great deal of the population of this earth. Professor R.A. Daly, in his book, Our Mobile Earth, has written this. In the last 4,000 years, earthquakes have caused the loss of 13 million lives and the most awful earth shock is yet to come. And that's interesting because we're going to find out a little later on in Revelation 16, 18, that there's a great earthquake such as there was not since there were men upon the earth. So great an earthquake, so mighty, and the cities of the nations fell. What a picture that you have here. Now, the earthquakes today are not a fulfillment of this. They just merely show that It could happen, as God's Word says it will. Now, verse 14 in my translation, "...and the heaven was removed as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places." Now, this verse, I think, is to be taken quite literally. 
We've had the same thing in Nahum 1, 5. We're going to see it again in Revelation 20, verse 11, and I'll save it till then. Now, I want to read verses 15 and 17 again in my translation. "...and the kings of the earth, and the princes, and the chief captains, and the rich, and the strong, and every bondman and free man, hid themselves in the caves and rocks of the mountains." And they say to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of the one sitting on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath came, and who is able to stand? Now, we have here something that's quite interesting. There are those on the earth that are praying to the rocks and to the mountains to fall on them because they want to be hidden from whom? The wrath of the Lamb. Now, this is the great day of the wrath of God. But now we come to an interesting statement, the wrath of the Lamb. Now, the wrath of God is that day, the day of the Lord, that day that we've seen all the way through the Old Testament. That is the Old Testament prophets. It's a day that is coming upon the earth. It's yet future. And we're told it's the wrath of the Lamb. Now, there is a strange statement. The Bible is filled with paradoxes, and I'm sure that you've discovered that Scripture bounds with them. Now, somebody says, well, what's a paradox? Well, haven't you heard the definition of a paradox? It's two doctors in conference. Well, there'd be a paradox, but this is different. It's a proposition which is contrary to received opinion, that is, that which is seemingly contradictory. On the surface, the assertion seems contradictory, but closer examination reveals it's factual. In other words, here's several of these paradoxes. The farther an object goes from you, the larger it gets. Now, you know that's not true, is it? But it is true. When a balloon goes up, it'll get smaller to the eye, but the balloon is getting larger all the time as the atmosphere gets thin. Then here's another paradox. Water flows uphill in Sequoia National Park. Somebody said, I don't believe it. Well, my friend, literally tons of it flows uphill. And you say, well, that certainly is a paradox. It certainly is. But Sequoia National Park is filled with giant redwoods. And those giant redwoods are pulling up tons of water all the time. They call it osmosis. That's a scientific word that means they don't know what really it's all about. But that's what's happening. And then the closer you get to the sun, the hotter it is. Well, out in the Hawaiian Islands, in a tropical climate, But you look up on the top of Mauna Kea, and there's snow up there, and it's closer to the sun than you are. May I say to you, there are a lot of paradoxes that are true. Now, the Christian life is a series of paradoxes. For when I was weak, then I'm strong. Well, we've got one here, the wrath of the Lamb. Now, the Lamb is a familiar figure of Christ. And how in the world can a little lamb that's noted for gentleness and meekness suppose it did get angry? What then? (laughs) It's like a tempest in a teapot. Well, will you notice, from the days of Abel to John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus Christ is depicted as a lamb. John says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, God did not choose the lamb because it possessed characteristics of Christ, neither sacrificial aspects. God created such an animal to represent Christ. And that little lamb was the animal. And that's the reason God created it, because Christ is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before any lamb was ever created. Now, he has the qualities of a lamb. He was meek, come unto me all ye that labor and heavy laden. He says, I'm meek and lowly. He was gentle, (laughs) suffer the little children to come unto me. He was harmless. You never saw a sign up, beware of the lamb. 
You've seen a sign, beware of a dog, but not a lamb. He was harmless. He was humble. Christ washed the feet of his disciples. Now, this is a tremendous thing. Here we have one whose life was marked by winsomeness. His life was like the perfume of a lovely and fragile flower. His coming was a doxology. His stay was a blessing. And his departure was a benediction. Even the unbelieving world has been fascinated by his life. Now, the Lamb sets forth his sacrifice. Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb, and God did provide himself a lamb. Then, what about the wrath? Well, that's strange and foreign even to the person of God, is it not? God, though, loves the good. God hates the evil. He does not hate as you and I hate. He's not vindictive. God is righteous, God is holy, and he hates that which is contrary to him. He calls himself Jehovah is a man of war. He's strong and mighty. He's mighty in battle. And the gospel reveals the wrath of God. Paul said the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And you look at this world we're in today, my friend. It reveals already the wrath of God, the judgment of God. Now, it's like mixing fire and water to bring wrath and a lamb together. But all the fury of the wrath of God's revealed in the lamb. May I say to you, when he was here, he made a scourge of small cords. He drove out the money changer. Was he bluffing? He was not. He called the religious rulers a generation of vipers, whited sepulchers. He cursed the fig tree. He said, Woe unto you, Capernaum. And Christ rejected Jerusalem, but he had tears in his eyes. He still controls the forces of nature, and he uses them in judgment. God has declared war against sin, and I say, Blessed be his name, and he'll not compromise with that which has brought such havoc to the human family. There is a day coming when the wrath of the Lamb will be revealed. Somebody said, I thought he was gentle and not punished sin. He says, Be wise now, therefore, ye kings, ye judges of the earth, kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the earth.